Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I've got nothing to add today, except that if you like this episode, please pass it on to someone who could benefit from it. Here's Alan. Today, I'm speaking with Alan Dafer. Alan is an assistant professor of political science at Yale University and co-director of the Governance of AI program at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. His research seeks to understand the causes of world peace and stability, and his current research focuses on helping humanity navigate safely through the invention of superhuman artificial intelligence. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Alan. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So we'll get to talking about how listeners can potentially have a career in AI strategy themselves. Uh, But first, tell me about the governance of AI program at at FHI in Oxford. Uh, Great. So the Future of Humanity Institute has for a long time uh, been thinking about transformative artificial intelligence and superintelligence, most notably with Nick Bostrom's superintelligence, uh, but also a lot of other scholars there have been uh, working and thinking about this. Uh, And recently we've come together in uh, a group that uh, is called the Governance of AI Program. Uh, and so that's almost a dozen of us are working on various aspects of the governance problem. So what kinds of uh, specific questions are you guys looking at? So I have a research agenda in the works, um, or it's a research landscape document that I've been working on that uh, systematizes the questions. And this might be getting into a, a big area, but uh, it can be broken up into three big categories. The first category we call the technical landscape, and that refers to all the questions related to trends in AI and to the properties of advanced AI, uh, their sort of political and strategic properties, uh, how difficult safety is. Um, so we can talk about that. The second sort of really bulky category we call AI politics, and that looks at all the dynamics around different groups, corporations, governments, the, the public as an actor, sort of pursuing their interests as they understand it, given their capabilities and trying to understand how that all plays out uh, and how we can address and mitigate the worst potential risks uh, from that and seize the opportunities. And then the third category is we call AI governance, which asks the question, if we're able to coordinate and cooperate, what should we cooperate to build? What are the institutions, the constitutional foundation of a global governance system? What are the challenges that it needs to address? Uh, What are the values that we want encoded into the uh, governance regime? So you've got about a dozen people in in one research group here. And my impression was that about two years ago, very few people were thinking about this. So so is it fair to say there's there's a lot, the interest in this topic is growing very fast? Absolutely. There's tremendous interest in this space. Um, I just came from lunch uh, after my talk and, uh, you know, the, the table is filled with, yeah, very interested, talented people wanting to find the way that they can best contribute. Currently, we're struggling with building a career pipeline and um, sort of a community that most efficiently directs talented individuals to the problems that they can best address. But that's yeah, one thing we're working on. Uh, so at um, the Beneficial AI Conference at Asilomar, several people commented that AI strategy, as this space is sometimes called, seems like it is in the place where AI safety was two years previously. So AI safety at the Puerto Rico conference was you know, barely an explicit uh, research commitment in the AI research community. There's this one um, story that is told about a PhD uh, supervisor and a PhD student meeting at the Puerto Rico conference, not realizing they were both interested in AI safety. So it was almost kind of a, I don't know, taboo or secret uh, interest. And now at at the Asilomar conference, uh, it's large and flourishing. We have research agendas. We have top labs working on this. AI strategy seems like it's at that beginning stage, such that in two years, we'll probably have, uh, you know, really much more substantial research community. But today, we're just figuring out what are the most important and tractable problems and you know, how we can best recruit to work on those problems. What do you think has caused people to get so interested in, in this topic now? Is it, you know, AlphaGo and big improvements in machine technology, or perhaps a Boston superintelligence book has kind of raised the alarm about the issues here? So I think AI strategy is within the community, we've historically called it, we can also call it AI governance or AI politics or other terms. It follows directly out of concern about transformative AI. And so I think the causes of its growth are the same as the causes of the growth in AI safety interest. It's just lagged by two years, probably because the people who most who first realized that AI safety is uh, something they should be working on were AI researchers. And so they were you know, they were more likely to see the problem right away, whereas social scientists, politicians, policymakers are more removed from this phenomenon. Absolute superintelligence had a huge impact on the world's uh, awareness of um, the dangers of advanced AI. And AlphaGo had a, a tremendous impact on the world's awareness of transformative AI, uh, which is a result 
uh, we could talk about. And also AlphaGo we could talk about is a bit of my history of how I kind of came online. Do you see your work as kind of just a continuation of previous research that's presumably been done on transformative technologies or potentially militarized technologies like like nuclear weapons? The academics must have thought about how destabilizing te- new technologies could be and how they could be made safe. Yeah, it's part of that conversation. But it's not just a continuation in the sense that the challenges posed by AI are radically different than the challenges posed by nuclear weapons. So part of our research today is engaging with those older literatures. Uh, So one thing that many of us read up a lot on uh, were the political efforts to have international control of nuclear weapons, the Brook Plan or the Atchison and Lilienthal Report, uh, which is really the inspiration behind that. That was a very uh, unique historical moment when we almost had strong global governance of a powerful technology. That didn't work out. And I would largely blame Stalin and uh, the Soviet Union for that. So we, we, it wasn't an, a clean natural experiment on uh, the viability of truly binding international control of a dangerous technology. Yeah. What do you think are the distinctive characteristics of uh, artificial intelligence from a political or an international governance point of view? Yeah, so several. Perhaps the most distinctive is that it's so dual use. Uh, so compared to uh, nuclear weapons uh, and nuclear energy, you know, nuclear energy is useful, but it wasn't crucially useful. Uh, Whereas AI seems like it's on track to be like the new electricity or the new industrial revolution in the sense that it's a general purpose technology that will completely transform and invigorate uh, the economy in every uh, sector of the economy. So that's one, I guess one problem is it's, or one difference is that it's economic bounty and, and, and the gradient of incentives to develop it are so much more substantial than most other dual use technologies we're used to thinking about governing. And then the second is the ease of separating the dangerous capabilities from the commercial and beneficial uh, capabilities. Uh, So in the Atchison and Lilienthal report, they talked about what components of the nuclear uh, cycle are intrinsically dangerous. These are the parts that you really, a country shouldn't be engaging in this activity unless it's thinking about building a nuclear weapon. Uh, And those are the the sites you want to control. And hopefully you have several of those sites. So you have sort of redundant control. Uh, Whereas with AI, it's a general purpose technology, you know, a powerful AI agent for some task uh, can often easily be deployed for another task that is considered a um, risk. So some people recently have started talking about artificial intelligence in terms of an arms race, I guess, either between companies or, or even potentially between between countries. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, so this language attracts a lot of attention. Some of the discussion of an AI arms race is not accurate in that it's some of the quotes are talking about a race for talent. Uh, so they're using the arms race in a, as a loose analogy. Uh, or a race between companies, but it's really not militaristic, you know, between Google and, say, Facebook. Uh, so those that's just hyperbole or just using a colorful metaphor. There's other discussion of an AI arms race uh, that, um, for example, most prominently was uh, stimulated by the quote that Putin uh, gave of whoever leads an AI will rule the world. Uh, so this quote garnered a huge amount of attention from media around the world uh, and also by serious thinkers of national security. Because one property of an arms race is that all, in many ways, all it takes is the perception that the other side believes it to be existing, believes that an arms race is taking place to generate the possibility of an arms race. Uh, So if I think that you believe this technology is strategic, even if I personally don't believe it to be strategic, then I need to now worry about what, how your beliefs might shape your behaviors and uh, your willingness to take risks. So this quote, uh, whoever leads an AI will, will rule the world. It was not an official statement of Russian foreign policy. It was not a summary of a report that the the Russian military produced. Rather, it was what seems to be an extemporaneous comment that Putin made in the context of giving children feedback on their science projects. So it was this um, televised uh, show where he was talking to Russian uh, students about their various science projects and congratulating them all and saying how this is the future of Russia, space travel or you know new material science and whatnot. What he had to say about AI was the most emphatic of all the technologies, but it was just one statement in this long Putin meets students of Russia event. However, that one quote was pulled out by the media, by AP, and, and seized upon by uh, the world. I think that teaches us the lesson that we have to be deliberate and, and thoughtful when talking about the possibility of an arms race. Uh, again, because it has this property that the mere talking about it 
can increase the probability that it takes place. There will be uh, substantial, tremendous risks from a racing dynamic. And so we ought to be very thoughtful and careful before uh, engaging in um, just a sort of knee-jerk reflection on what's taking place. I'd like to quote Demis Hassabis on this. The coordination problem is one thing we should focus on now. We want to avoid this harmful race to the finish where corner cutting starts happening and safety gets cut. That's going to be a big issue on a global scale, and that's going to be a hard problem when you're talking about national governments. So I think that captures the whole or the crux of the, the challenge uh, without being inflammatory and likely to instill fear in other national security communities. It would be kind of a fitting irony for the, the craziness of humanity if uh, we end up effectively destroying the world because someone made an off-the-cuff uh, remark at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, uh, at a school event uh, just praising their science projects. So that, that, that could be the end of us. Um, it actually, the, the fact that he said that almost suggests to me that they're not really racing to produce artificial intelligence because if, if that was the plan of the Russian government, they probably wouldn't randomly announce it while he's visiting a a high school. (laughs) Yes. And part of what he said is, so Putin actually said, because a race would be dangerous, that is why Russia is going to give away its AI capabilities to the world. So he almost had a sort of an open AI, uh, early open AI stance on how Russia would be a benevolent AI power. Interesting. I guess that didn't get reported so much. It wasn't wasn't as interesting to people. So there might be some people listening who think, you know, super intelligence uh, isn't going to come anytime soon. And others who think you know, it might come soon, but it's not going to be that risky. Things are going to be fine. You know, people are fretting over over nothing. What, what would you say to, to skeptics like that? So to the first perspective that let's forget about super intelligence. Let's just say that transformative artificial intelligence. Uh, this is artificial intelligence that could radically disrupt uh, wealth, power or world order. Some people hold the perspective that this is if it's coming, it's coming in many decades. The easiest response is to say that you should have a portfolio of policy investments uh, that focus on different risks. And if you cannot with confidence rule out this potentially large risk and opportunity, then some research and and policy efforts should be spent on it. But I also think we can more directly address uh, the question. I would point out that even with just today's AI technology, if there were no more uh, structural improvements in AI performance, we just collected more data built more sensors, more computing capability, but uh, we stopped Moore's law in its tracks uh, and we stopped algorithmic scientific improvement in AI. I think we can already see some extreme systemic risks that could emerge from AI. So to give you four, and I'm happy to talk about these, but uh, one would be mass labor displacement, unemployment and inequality. Uh, It's plausible that today's AI and the AI revolution that will be generated from the application of AI to industry could dramatically increase unemployment and inequality. Two, it's plausible that AI is what is called a strategic industry, or it's a natural global oligopoly, in that various properties of AI services mean that an incumbent company is able to basically retain a monopoly in that service, in that sector. Uh, So if you think about Facebook, if you think about Google, if you think about Amazon, each of these are companies that it's very hard to compete with on their core industry. And if that's the case, if AI services in general have this property, which could arise from uh, the digitization of services, so there's a zero marginal cost or a low marginal cost in what they're providing, as well as to other sources of increasing returns to scale, um, such as this virtual cycle in AI that once you have some consumers, they provide data, which allows your algorithm to become better, which gets you more consumers and so forth. Uh, this would mean, or this could mean, a move away from a sort of liberal economic world order and logic that has governed the past decades where free trade increases all countries' wealth and, and countries have really sort of uh, embraced this logic of cooperation and economic productivity. Uh, and you could have a reversion to economic nationalism, protectionism, mercantilism, where countries are each trying to build up their own AI champion in the way that has been done in the past with oil companies or automobile or commercial aircraft. And you can see that today where most of the AI companies are in the US and the main rival comes from China, which has basically been protectionist with its market. You know, it's excluded American companies and cultivated its own uh, sort of AI champions. That was second extreme possibility. (laughs) Uh, Maybe I'll just go quickly. Three and four. Three is surveillance and control. You can imagine ubiquitous sensors, algorithms that can identify individuals through face recognition, through gait, through other kinds of behavioral signatures. We're basically already there, I think. We're all carrying around uh, location detectors in our pockets every day. I agree. I, I don't think it would be that hard to, to build a, a full system to monitor the public, uh, track what they're saying and doing, 
profile, identify individuals who might be a challenge to some political objective or an ally, have tailored persuasion. You know, what much of the ad research money is going to is figuring out how you can persuade individuals to buy some product or, or feel differently about something. And then lastly, robotic repression. You know, many coups or authoritarian governments fell because the army was not willing to fire on the citizens. And if you have autonomous weapons that have a good independent chain of command that doesn't go through a human, then citizens might lose that uh, protection of sort of human decency. Yeah, this really only requires the willingness to, to build these these capabilities as a, as, a, as a major state. Yes, and if the public has power, their failure to sort of defend themselves from that such a system. Yeah. And then there's a fourth uh, that, and again, to, to clarify, all of this, I think, comes from AI today. We don't need to concoct a science fiction story of new technology to, to generate this capability. And the fourth is strategic stability. It may be that imagery intelligence from satellites, from uh, subsea sensors, from passive sensors or submersibles that are tracking, say, submarine ballistic missiles uh, to uh, analysis of social network behavior would be sufficient to reveal most of the submarine ballistic missiles and mobile ballistic missiles that are the, currently the two most secure arms of the nuclear triad. And if that were to happen, couple that with hypersonic missiles that shorten the uh, time to from launch to when a decision needs to be made about retaliating, uh, it could lead to a much more instable world. So these are just four uh, possibilities that are generated or, generated or exacerbated by narrow AI as we see it today that we need to think about a lot more. Uh, and none of that required speculating that we could have superhuman intelligence in various domains. We can also talk about why such a possibility is not improbable. So how urgently do we need to figure out solutions to, to these problems? When, when can we expect artificial intelligence to be dramatically better than, than today? So the problems I previously mentioned that go through mostly with 2017 AI, uh, we need to obviously start thinking about those urgently. There's then a whole other set of governance challenges that comes from human level and superhuman level AI in various domains or in general. So it could be that you just get so to walk it back a bit, you could have superhuman AI just on some strategic domains. So it could be, say, just in cyber or just in profiling or social network mapping and manipulation or math or science and technology. Or you could have human level or superhuman level AI across the board or in all domains that are strategically relevant. It's, it's hard to understand what those different possibilities would mean for the economy, for strategic stability, for political order. In terms of when, how much time we have, basically we don't know. We don't understand intelligence well enough. We've never, in history, we've never observed uh, an intelligence explosion or uh, the emergence of uh, machine intelligence before. We don't have other civilizations that we can look at to get a good frequentist estimate. So I'll, I'll say a bit about how to have an informed belief. So one thing we've done is survey AI experts. And that shouldn't be thought of as really authoritative. They are experts at building AI. They are not necessarily experts at forecasting progress in AI. Uh, current research that's being done in the community is to take forecasting more seriously, to get more data, to calibrate, see how well people are doing, uh, and use the other tools of um, forecasting to try and have uh, improved forecasts. However, taking the survey of AI experts as we had it, you see a range of opinions. Some, these are published researchers at the top two conferences in AI. Some think it could happen very soon, and it is human-level machine intelligence defined as when machines are better than humans at every task. And some researchers think it would not happen for many decades or even 100 years. However, the, if you take sort of the average or the median of those perspectives, there's enough probability mass on the near term. Say 10 years, there's about 10% probability. In 25 years, there's about 30% probability that if we just take that as a reasonable credence, uh, you know, basis for our credence, that is a sufficiently high probability that we ought to be taking it seriously. Now, I can say a bit more about why we might think it could come quickly. Uh, so one argument by sort of anecdote is that it's happened before. AlphaGo is illustrative of this. Uh, we were surprised by progress in Go, uh, not necessarily because there was a technical breakthrough, but because a company deployed a lot of talent and resources towards a problem that we didn't realize they were doing. So that caught us the world off guard, as it were. 
but they might have anticipated that it was possible given that investment. There are other examples, uh, like to give one, the, the Atari game Frostbite. If you look at EFF metrics page, it has this lovely figure where it was basically a uh, highly su- subhuman from 2013 through to the middle of 2015. It could barely play the game. And then if you were to extrapolate from that data, you might conclude 2050 to 2100 would be about when it's going to reach human level. But by the end of 2015, some publications came out that showed a dramatic improvement to human level and then superhuman level uh, over the course of one year. So other games show a similar uh, quick change in the rate of progress. And then in other games, we see a more steady change in the rate of progress. Uh, This is part of what we will be researching with others is to try and have more informed forecasts. But I can also give you some more technical answers and sort of more inside view answers for why progress changes in capability of AI and especially towards AGI could be much faster than we expect. First, we really don't understand intelligence well enough. We don't know what are the core missing pieces and how independent they are. It's plausible that there could be some common factor to many of the capabilities that are currently being worked on. And once we crack that common factor, the rest of the pieces will either fall into place or become less important for solving these general intelligence tasks. An example of a common factor is a good world model. You know, a machine capable of developing a knowledge graph of the world, of people, of history, of technology, uh, so that it can then integrate new knowledge, you know, by if it reads a physics textbook, it can incorporate that knowledge into its world model, uh, and it can integrate various kinds of narrow AI systems together. That could be really transformative. As has been discussed before, for example, in superintelligence, the possibility of highly recursive self-improvement could generate rapid changes if there's a narrow AI capability that permits self-improvement uh, in AI research. There's another whole class of um, reasons why we might think progress could be surprisingly fast, and that is if there's what's called overhang in various inputs uh, to AI. So most talked about is hardware overhang. If we're in a world where we already have so much computing power out there that once we devise this uh, AGI algorithm, artificial general intelligence algorithm, if it can run on a laptop, then you have you know many laptops equivalents that it could run on. Uh, so you go from a world with no AGIs to many millions. Uh, we could have what's called insight overhang if there are key breakthroughs in algorithmic design that the human scientists just missed. They're kind of waiting there to be plucked, and then they will add efficiency to, to machine learning. Uh, there's a nice example of this um, by Bellamir et al. Uh, of DeepMind, where they show that if you just use the full distribution of the value function rather than take the expectation, you get dramatically improved performance really quite substantial, more than many other algorithmic improvements over the span of uh, many months. And this is an insight that, in retrospect, seems like something that someone could have seen at the time, but we didn't. And so it's plausible that there's other such insights just waiting to be found that if you had an AI AI researcher, a machine intelligence AI researcher, that it could potentially pluck those. Then there's what we can call data overhang. So there's an overhang of data waiting to be analyzed by a system capable of analyzing it. And the best example, I think, for this is the internet. You know, the corpus of works of Shakespeare and history, strategy, strategic thinking, physics textbooks, you know, social books, (laughs) basically any kind of book that has encoded knowledge that at some point a machine capable of interacting with a human at a high intellectual level could make sense of the knowledge in there. And and potentially read very fast if if it has enough hardware. Read very fast, never forget what it's read once it integrates it into the massive knowledge graph that it's building. And then there's one last argument for why you might see really rapid and broad, or in this case, rapid development of systems. And this is the train to execute ratio of computing costs. So in current machine learning systems, it costs around one to 100 million times more computing power to train an algorithm than it does cost to deploy that same algorithm. And so what that means is if you were to say, train up your first AGI, if you want to repurpose that computing power that you use to train it, to deploy it, you don't just have one AGI in the world, you now might have 10 million. Can you explain how how that works? Yeah, it's one way researchers develop algorithms is through reinforcement learning in a simulated environment. You have, so you can think about those Majoku runners that are trying to learn to go over obstacles or AlphaGo Zero, for example. It's playing with itself in this simulated environment and gradually making sense of its environment and learning heuristics and, and whatever strategies it needs to to succeed. But it costs a lot of computing power to to run that algorithm again and again and again as it's gradually making sense of its environment and learning. Okay, so you know, AlphaGo Zero is run for, say, well, several days or 30 days before it gets to its really high-level performance. But then once you have that system, once you have the, that set of trained weights in the neural network, you can then deploy it with a much smaller uh, computing uh, power width. 
I've, I've also heard that you can uh, speed this stuff up a lot by producing specialized chips that do the necessary operations much faster than, than a generalized computer chip would do. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there have been substantial improvements. I mean, first going from CPUs to GPUs and now GPUs to TPUs. And many people are wondering what's the next uh, sort of hardware improvement that will accelerate. So we've talked about a range of different uh, issues there. What do you think is the, the most important question to, to deal with quickly in, in, this, in this field? Some problems are more important than others. However, we are sufficiently uncertain about what are the core problems that need to be solved that are precise enough and modular enough that they can be really focused at that I would recommend a different approach. So rather than, than try to find really the, the highest leverage, you know, most neglected problem, I would advise uh, people interested in working in the space to get a feel for the research landscape uh, and they can look at some of the talks at EAG and then ask themselves, what are their comparative advantages? What's their sort of driving interest or passion? Do they believe they have an insight that's neglected, an idea? What's their background? What's the community of scholars and policymakers they would see themselves as you know, most comfortable in? And then either hopefully with the help of their community and, and we will try to help uh, and ADK can help uh, try to map those that individual to the part of the research landscape where they fit best. So rather than optimize the whole community into one narrow problem, I would say let's optimize the community, you know, a mapping from the distribution of comparative advantages to the distribution of problems. Try to find a modular project that they can work on. Uh, so you can do that in consultation with others. Examples of modular project include case studies of historical analogs. You know, we were discussing uh, the Baruch plan and the Atchison, Atchison and Lilienthal report. So that's one historical moment. But there's other analogies in history that we can look to. Everything from CERN as an, a collaborative scientific endeavor, the International Space Station, or international collaboration over nuclear fusion. Those offer a different kind of an analogy that's imperfect. There's other international control of dual-use technologies, analogies that we can look to. So, so there's historical work to be done. There's also a lot of economic work to be done, modeling race dynamics, modeling tech development. Uh, there's forecasting work to be done, which is kind of a mix of quant modeling and almost psychology and you know, working with experts. There's ethics work to be done and morality, moral philosophy to be done. There's governance design, so institutional design, constitutional design. There's public opinion research to be done. So there's, you know, I could just go on and on. There's so much work. One way of thinking about it is that the AI revolution will touch on everything. And political processes are sufficiently interdependent that many parts of that could be critical for how it all plays out. And so because of that, we basically need a social science of the AI revolution. And, and we need it fast, I guess. <laughs> and well, we don't know how quickly we need yeah. it. Uh, and well, so, I suppose that, that's at least a little bit reassuring. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we have more, than, more time than, than we think. Yes, but we should... Uh, not dawdle. No. Uh, and I will say in this respect, some fields are moving faster than others. Economists are taking this seriously. So Darren Asimoglu, Charles Jones at Stanford, and some others are really considering what transformative AI could mean in terms of modeling growth, modeling unemployment, uh, and labor displacement. Political scientists that I've spoken with, almost all of them think this project is important and worth pursuing and interesting, but it does pose methodological challenges to what some branches of political science prefer. So, you know, it's hard to be quantitative about the future. It's hard to do experiments about the future because we're so uncertain correctly, if we're being scientifically humble about what the future will look like, it means we have to be open to a lot of possibilities. And so it's hard to draw firm conclusions. I think AI social science, the social science of the AI revolution really has to embrace uh, that the question should guide the research and not the method. Uh, we need to look where we thought we dropped the keys, not where the lamplight is. I've heard some people say recently that in new research fields uh, like like this one, that are kind of pre-paradigmatic is the term that they've used. So it's it's so early that we don't even know exactly how to think about these problems, uh, that you need a particular kind of person to be able to make progress there. So you always kind of need a certain boldness and a certain creativity to do to do any novel research, and, and you often need like quite a lot of intelligence as well. But when you're moving into a new field, maybe you need those even more than you would, uh, or, the, or than you will later on once um, someone has mapped out the space and defined how you can um, find solutions to these problems. Do, do, do you agree with that perspective? I do. Uh, Carrick Flynn, who works at uh, the Governance of AI program uh, at the Future of Humanity Institute, he's characterized this as disentangling research, the challenge of disentangling all the threads and possibilities to really generate a clear research agenda and a, a clear vision of the problems. So this does seem like the highest priority for our research. However, it's hard to do this kind of work at scale. 
And so I think that just means that people who, who think they have uh, or they might be able to contribute to this kind of revisioning of what the nature of the problem, what kind of work needs to be done, people should try their hand at it and should try to articulate how they see the problem and what research needs to be done to, to reduce our, our uncertainty. However, I do think at this point we've identified enough tractable questions that there's normal science to be done, that researchers from a range of fields and institutional design, like public choice, diplomatic history, you know, international relations, sort of conventionally conceived, uh, and also quantitative study of international relations, forecasting. There are lots of projects uh, for talented, motivated people to work on uh, that I, I think have sufficiently well-defined contours uh, that people can get started on it. So you both need disentanglers and then kind of workarounds to um, solve the problems that have been disentangled. Yes, and there's a lot of work to be done. And there's a lot of interest coming into the space, which is really exciting to see. I would just encourage people to perhaps not be frustrated if it's hard for them to find their niche just yet and just read everything they can, uh, talk to people, try to find some part of the problem that they can make a contribution on, and then get working at it. So how did you get into this field? I don't imagine this was what you were studying as an undergrad or even in your PhD. Actually, not in my PhD, but it was what I was looking at as an undergrad. Oh, interesting. Uh, so this goes back to the, uh, I, I mean, I think I've always been interested in computers and artificial intelligence. I followed Kasparov and Deep Blue. And it was actually Ray Kurzweil's Age of Spiritual Machines, uh, which is, you know, an old book, mm. uh, 2001. And it had this really compelling graph. Uh, it's sort of cheesy and it involves a lot of simplifications. But in short, it shows uh, basically Moore's Law at work and, you know, extrapolated ruthlessly into the future. Uh, and then on the second y-axis, it shows the biological equivalent of computing capacity of the machine. So it shows a dragonfly and then, I don't know, a primate and then a human and then all humans. And now that correspondence is hugely problematic. And there's lots we could say about why that's not a, a sensible thing to do. But what I think it did communicate was that the likely extrapolation of trends are such that you are going to have very powerful computers within 100 years. So who knows exactly what that means and, and whether in what sense it's human level or whatnot. But the fact that this, this trend is coming uh, on the timescale it, it was, was very compelling to me. But at the time, I thought Kurzweil's projection of the social dynamics of how uh, extremely advanced AI would play out unlikely. And, and it, you know, it's very optimistic and utopian. Uh, and so I actually looked for a way to study this all through my undergrad. So I took courses and I taught courses on technology and society and I thought about going into science writing and I, I started a PhD program in science and technology studies at Cornell University, which sounded vague in general enough that I could study you know, AI and humanity. But it turns out science and technology studies, especially at Cornell, means um, more a social constructivist approach to science and technologies. So actually, I wrote my master's thesis on technological determinism. And one of the case studies uh, is uh, the Meiji Restoration. So here you have Japan basically rejecting the world uh, and saying, we want this Tokugawa regime uh, to live on uh, the way you know, we envision it. And eventually, the world kind of intervened, um, Commodore Perry via you know, the U.S. wanting to trade in coal. And that just shows how the, the ability of a, a group of people to s sort of socially construct the world they want is limited by, in this case, military constraints, military competition, and more generally also by economic competition. Uh, okay, so anyhow, I went into political science because actually I, I initially wanted to study AI in something, and I was going to do uh, look at labor implications of AI. And then I became distracted, as it were, by great power politics and, and great power peace and war. It touched on the existential risk dimensions that I didn't have the word for it, but was uh, sort of a driving interest of mine. It's strategic, which is interesting. Anyhow, and so that's what I uh, did my PhD on and topics related to that. And then my sort of early career at Yale. And I should say, all, during all this time, I was still fascinated by AI. And at you know, social events or you know, having a chat with a friend, I would often turn to AI and, and sort of the future of humanity and often conclude a conversation by saying, but don't worry, we still have time because machines are still worse than humans at Go. Right? Here is a game that's well-defined. It's, you know, it's perfect information, two players, zero sum. Uh, the fact that a machine can't beat us at Go means we have some time before they're writing better poems than us, before they're uh, making better investments than us, before they're you know, leading countries. Well, in 2016... DeepMind revealed AlphaGo, and it was almost this canary in the coal mine that Go was to me, the sort of deep in my subconscious, killed over and died. <laughs> uh, and it, that sort of acti activated me. I realized that for a long time I'd said 
post tenure, I would start working on AI. Uh, and then with that, I realized that uh, we couldn't wait. And so I actually reached out to uh, Nick Bostrom at the Future of Humanity Institute and began uh, conversations and collaboration with them. And it's been exciting and you know, lots of work to, to do that, that we've been busy with ever since. So let's talk now about some concrete advice that we can offer to listeners who are really interested in these topics, that, that they're still listening to us and they're thinking, I might want to work on this kind of research uh, with, with my career. My impression is that it's been quite hard to get people uh, working on this problem or, or especially to, to train them up because you, you were saying um, there isn't a great pipeline because it's a new area. So we're having to, to figure things out as we go along. And there aren't an, enough people uh, working in the area to have a lot of mentors, a lot of teachers who can explain all of this to everyone. So given those, given those challenges, uh, what, what can people do if they want to get into the field? A first suggestion would be uh, just read and expose yourself to the conversation. Uh, so there are some pieces of work coming online. Uh, of course, superintelligence and uh, Yudkowsky's writings and a lot of the uh, work in the, uh, the community, uh, sort of less formal publications, touches on many issues. But also increasing uh, work in sort of more academic work is uh, starting to emerge. So read that, look at the EAG talks uh, and others, attend events, try to find a part of the problem. So the, you know, the research landscape is vast. If you can just find part of that that you have a comparative advantage in that seems interesting and that others agree would be useful for you to work on, then tackle that and, and feed that back into the community. Uh, and that's a good way to be useful right away, to learn more about the community, and then ultimately to prepare yourself to do other work that's perhaps adjacent to that initial work. Uh, okay, two, I would say it actually may be possible to do a lot of this work within academia. Uh, we just don't know exactly how yet. Uh, so economists are increasingly building problems out related to transformative AI as a legitimate topic of inquiry. Uh, so that's good for economists. Political scientists, I think there's a, a, a number of ways that you can situate the challenges from transformative AI into canonical problems. Uh, and so you just need to sort of learn how to, how to pose AI as an element of, you know, um, dual use technologies or emerging technology, governance of emerging technologies or other kinds of technologies with various strategic properties, or looking at historical analogs of cooperation, or national or uh, regional industrial policy for leadership in advanced technologies. Uh, and in doing so, uh, even though there aren't many professors whose active research is on transformative AI, I think there are many that are sympathetic to it, especially if you can get the framing right enough that it fits within uh, an existing scholarly vocabulary. So uh, just at Oxford and at Yale, I've been impressed by uh, the extent to which we can find sympathetic professors who would supervise students uh, who can get uh, the framing right. Uh, and then three, I would say, I think we are identifying more and more uh, sort of professors who can do the supervision, who do take these issues seriously and who could be you know, a supervisor and really understand the importance of this new field and, and are willing to support it. So in summary, it is a challenge right now to, to figure out exactly how you can feed in. I do think we're getting better. I think at the Future of Humanity Institute and, and in the community more broadly, we're getting a better uh, sort of on-ramp for new people and we're able to allocate talent to different problems uh, and just do your best, be patient and excited and just keep reading and thinking and, and try to enter the community in one way or another uh, so that you can make sure you're you know, contributing as best you can. How does that uh, on-ramp look like? Is there anything that, people, that, that, that exists that people might not be aware of? So the on-ramp in part looks like sending an email to someone. I'll just add that Alan later said that the best address to email is info at governance.ai. If it's appropriate for you in your career, apply for an internship or a, a longer term position at the Future of Humanity Institute or at other uh, locations as they emerge and, and the positions arise. Uh, there's actually a lot of sort of more conventional funding sources and positions that are, I believe, compatible with also studying transformative AI. So you can think in cybersecurity, uh, you know, cybersecurity is not that far away from transformative AI in the cyber domain, so you could go in that direction. Work on autonomous weapons would be another area. Thinking about employment and um, the welfare state and universal basic income and inequality would be, you know. So in many ways, you may not want to focus on AI. You may want to focus on the issue area that, for whatever reason, you have a comparative advantage in that AI is going to impinge on in the near or medium term. And you think then you'll be able to trans transfer into other issues as they as they come along because you have like the most relevant expertise. Yeah, transfer or perhaps you're the specialist in that area. I mean, we certainly need um, like again coming back to labor displacement, inequality, unemployment. 
These are such a large social challenge that I don't think we're going to saturate that field and solve the, you know, that problem. And as transformative AI really comes online, uh, we will need that expertise to work closely with us and to provide frameworks for thinking about how do we redesign the social contracts, redistribution systems, cultures, uh, senses of self-worth. What's the sort of yeah, the future viable model of a say liberal country in a world where either people are being constantly knocked out of their occupation and need to retrain, or even they're uh, just a large proportion of the population is systematically unemployed. So quite a few people have found it challenging to get into uh, this field, but my impression is that it's probably going to get easier over time. Uh, firstly, because it's going to develop and, and the process for training people and putting them into good roles is, is going to become more mature. But also just the level of interest is rising so quickly that I expect that demand for people who know about this topic is going to outstrip the actual supply because we've been very constrained in our ability to train people up. Do, do you think that's right? I do. Yeah. And that's actually a, a good sort of I, maybe fourth point. I, I lost my enumeration from before. I think there's so much interest in artificial intelligence, both from industry side, from government, from philanthropy, from other areas. While in some ways it's a risky move to enter this this space uh, for someone who's in a sort of traditional discipline or uh, field, uh, in other ways it's a safe move because uh, there's just such a great demand for uh, expertise. We've spoken a lot about the questions and the problems and less about the, the solutions and answers this time. So I think hopefully we'll get a chance to speak next year or the year after about how the research is going and what kinds of answers you're getting. Uh, but do you generally feel like you're, you're making progress? Some, some listeners might think, well, this is all very important, but I just don't really believe that we can answer these questions. It's all going to be so speculative and we don't know what the world will look like in five or 10 or 20 years time when it becomes relevant. Uh, so maybe we shouldn't bother even studying it at this point. Yes. So certainly it's hard to study the future. Uh, there's, and, and it's important to be appropriately scientifically humble about our abilities to say things with confidence about the future. So whenever we're making plans 10 years out, uh, we need to have uh, large error bars around the assumptions in our models and so forth. But I do think we can say productive things. As you mentioned, we didn't cover that today, but we've just been start starting in this work and we've already uh, glimpsed some productive contributions, insights, and policy recommendations. A lot more work needs to be done on those before we uh, are ready to sort of share them and, and advocate for them. But the lack of progress in them so far is not for want of tractability. It's not that the problems are hard or intractably hard uh, so much as lack of time. Um, you know, we're pulled in so many different directions, uh, trying to build the community, speaking at various events, that the amount of time we have left for research is just so far has not been sufficient to develop all these ideas. So just judging the, the promise of this area based on the number of ideas that no one's written up yet, but people have uh, in our community. I think it's a very promising uh, area for more intellectual effort. So for technical AI research, there's the NIPS conference every year. Is there a conference now for AI strategy and AI policy? There is not. And again... Maybe that's something that listeners could potentially help to organize. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I mean, there are events of various kinds that bring together different subsets of this community. And there's at least one event on the horizon that looks like it could be uh, sort of a, a core event for this. But uh, because AI strategy and governance touches on such a range of issues, uh, th I mean, there are events. Uh, there's just not a single one. So we just came back from the Partnership on AI inaugural meeting in Berlin. Uh, and there are uh, a range of issues from well, near-term challenges that are, are confronting society today with how to deploy algorithms in a way that uh, represents our values and, and sort of advances them rather than perhaps distorts or loses some concerns. Two issues about safety critical systems. That's one institutional vehicle for these conversations. We'll see. It, it has a lot of promise, but we'll see to what extent it really flourishes. Uh, and others are just cropping up all over the place. Um, OECD events, uh, UN has a new center on AI and robotics. Governments are hosting conversations. There's academic conferences of various kinds. And then those more in the EA community. So for technical AI safety research, there's the concrete problems in AI safety that's become this kind of canonical paper that uh, people can read in order to, to get across the field and understand exactly what it looks like. Is there a similar canonical paper now for, for AI policy laying out the issues in a very specific way and making them academically credible? Uh, there is not a single paper. There are some papers on AI policy focus more on near-term challenges, and we can link those perhaps. And then we are actively working on a paper sketching the research landscape and the, the nature of the problem. Uh, we often use the language of governance, so the governance problem, um, but you can also think of that as AI policy uh, from the perspective of extreme challenges. We are working on those papers and they should be available 
at the time that this goes to air. And if not, uh, an interested listener can uh, reach out to us for an early copy. I'll try to put up links to everything that we've discussed uh, in, in this episode in, in the blog post. So uh, if, it's, if it's out by that point, then I'll, I'll link to it in, in the blog post when this goes out. And if not, uh, when it, whenever it is released. There's a lot of specific questions I could ask you, like places to work or people to study with, or you know, a, list, you know, a list of questions in the area. But they're actually pretty well covered in our AI uh, policy career guide, uh, which people can go take a look at. And I think I think you've read that and, and put in some suggestions. So we, we don't so much have to have to rehash that here. Uh, but one final question. If you were uh, thinking of um, taking on a PhD student, what kinds of qualities would, would you be looking for? What would be like the real, is there anything unusual that, that people can look for in themselves to, to tell that they're a good fit to do this kind of research? So I don't know if there's anything distinct uh, that would distinguish them from other fields. You know, I think the most important traits are smarts, <laughs> intelligence, and, and that's a, a multidimensional uh, concept, of course. So um, there's different uh, kinds of intelligence and drive, you know, whether that comes from passion or from conviction or work ethic. Those are the two most important traits. And then there's a, a number of skill sets and comparative advantages that we might look for. But as I mentioned, the scope for research is so large that it's unlikely that that's going to be the limiting consideration. And even people who are perhaps outside of the most useful set of you know, backgrounds, I think, could retool within a year and produce useful contributions. Because we've talked so much here about the problems and less about the about the solutions, uh, people might come away with a bit of a like doom and gloom kind of perspective. Uh, are you optimistic about our ability to to solve these problems over the next fifty or hundred years or however long we have to do it? I think I am dispositionally optimistic, and one probably needs to be to work on this in the right uh, mental state going forward. Rationally, it's hard to form you know confident beliefs about the difficulty of surmounting this challenge. I am pr- hopeful uh, that humanity can can overcome this challenge. It, in many ways, it's our final test uh, for our ability to cooperate, for our ability to build institutions, to, uh, to represent our values. Uh, you know, I think we often take for granted the current world. Uh, we we think, you know, the world is the way it is and we're, there's selection bias and what kinds of news we're exposed to. So, It's striking how many people think the world is worse today than it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Uh, But in almost every metric, you know, from Steven Pinker and others, uh, it's clear that the world is becoming uh, more peaceful, more liberal, uh, you know, better in in almost every metric, except perhaps for exposure to existential risk (laughs) from advanced technologies. And there's no reason why we can't continue that trend. Uh, We're we're this close to uh, really overcoming... Um, all the, the sort of challenges and, and um, catastrophes that history has subjected us to. And the stakes are tremendous, that not only is the downside vast, but the upside is, is huge. Uh, the amount of wealth uh, and scientific and intellectual insight that could come from advanced AI uh, and just human happiness and, and flourishing is so vast that I think if we can maintain that perspective, that the gains from cooperation are tremendous, and the, the losses from failed cooperation are, are so vast, and that we've come so far as humanity. You know, most countries today that feel like a nation, they, they were in the past not a nation. They were warring regions or warring tribes. It is possible for us to come together and, and construct an identity that overlooks the diff- differences of the past. Here's our, you know, final hurdle. Can we overlook the differences between different um, perspectives, different cultures, and recognize our common interest? And yeah, I guess I'm hopeful it, it maybe just for literary reasons that it seems like uh, the, the sort of tempo of the narrative is is going to uh, a difficult but ultimately victorious ending uh, so I think we can get there my guest today has been Alan Defo thanks for coming on the 80,000 hours podcast Alan thanks this was great if you'd like to learn more we've put a bunch of useful links in the blog post associated with today's show the 80,000 hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris thanks for joining talk to you next week